Hi everyone and welcome to the lecture on Daisy Miller part two. This week we're going to be looking at the second half of Henry James's novel Daisy Miller and talking about its connections to realism. So as we begin I want to clarify what happens in the second half of the novel. You'll remember that Winterburn meets Daisy again in Rome and that she's developed an attachment to an Italian man and they're basically creating what would be considered a social scandal. So um, he and um, others in her circle start to try to warn her, but even after she's giving these warnings, Daisy refuses to conform to society's expectations. And in fact, part of her refusal to do that is um, going out with Mr. Giovanelli into different places and at different times of day when it wouldn't be considered appropriate for a single woman to be seen with a man. And at one of these um, times, she goes out late at night and she catches what's called the Roman fever. This would be malaria. And then she eventually dies. So the end of the novel then is Winterburn coming to terms with the fact that he's making a judgment about her character and what he thinks about what she knows about society. So basically, was she doing something on purpose or was she innocent and didn't really understand? And then kind of grappling with the fact that she has died. And then the narrator tells us he goes back to his life and people are also gossiping about him and his attachment to an older woman in Geneva. So there is this kind of full circle-ness that's happening in the text where we end up learning that people are talking about him the same way that he was thinking about Daisy. So the end of the novel is going to kind of ask us to think about Winterburn's own relationship to society and conventions, just as we've looked at his judgment of Daisy and her relationship to society and conventions as well. One of the ways that we can think about this issue of Daisy and what she's doing and how knowledgeable she is, is to think of how the novel positions her as a type of text that needs to be read or interpreted. And really this problem of reading is one of the main conflicts within the text. So again, in realism, you're not having dramatic issues that are coming up. It's not a sensation novel. It's not something that's going to have these really starkly um, huge earth-shattering conflict points. Instead, it's really focused on the everyday. So we're really looking at how do we figure out who somebody is, which seems really small, but then when you think about trying to interpret or understand someone and how unknowable another person can be, it's actually quite a complex philosophical question that's being raised by the novel. So the main conflict then, this how to read Daisy's character, is really shown to us through Winterburn and his fascination with Daisy. And really that kind of conflict depends on us as readers also not being able to read Daisy. And there's a long section in the second half that talks about this idea of how can we categorize Daisy? How, are, how is she being read by us and by others? And, and how we're really kind of uncertain and other people are um, also making decisions that could influence us, but we're not really certain as readers um, which side to come down on about Daisy either. And Winterburn embodies this same confusion about how to categorize her. And this becomes not just, you know, a small problem for him, but also a societal problem. And we see Mrs. Walker inviting a lot of different types of people to her party, and she even describes them as textbooks. Right, that she could read them and think about them and make judgments about them based on their behaviors. And this is the kind of thing that she does to Daisy as well, that she's reading her in a certain way and judging her um, based on how she's reading her. And then Winterburn is uncertain how to read her and he's really not sure and he's kind of intrigued by this ambiguity about her. But then eventually what we see in the scene at the very end where she's out um, with, with Mr. Giovanelli late at night is that he makes this decision about her that he says now I knew exactly who she was because any respectable woman would not be out after dark late at night isolated alone with a man and to give you an idea of how scandalous or shocking this would be even though um, she and Mr. Giovanelli were not caught doing anything in today's society, it would be the equivalent of walking in on somebody um, while they're having an affair. So it's, it's that shocking to him. It's that scandalous. The fact that she would be out unaccompanied alone at night with him in a location um, that's dark, it implies that things are happening between them. 
even though he doesn't see anything happening. So her reputation is basically ruined and he makes this decision that she is bad and he can't make excuses for her anymore. But then what we see after her death is that Giovanelli defends her and says that she was innocent and that she didn't actually do anything that would be considered wrong. And so he actually, Winterburn himself, begins to question his own role in creating or constructing Daisy's identity in a certain way. So it's important for us to think about this issue of someone acting in a certain way and us constructing them or reading them and then that becomes um, who they are in public or who they are in society regardless of whether or not that is true. So this issue of an identity being constructed by society and constrained by society rather than having freedom and personal choice and how one is um, read or identified within the world. Now, if you're interested in psychoanalytic literary theory or psychoanalytic theory in general, then you might have heard of this term as the, uh, of the other and the other being a mirror for the self. There's this idea, idea that self-identity can be created based on opposition to the other. And essentially what that means is that you know yourself better once you know what you are not. If you see what someone else is and you can recognize and say, that's not who I am, then it gives you a sense of superiority perhaps, um, a, a more clearly defined sense of what you do in terms of your own gender identity, um, your own ethnicity, all these markers of identity are often learned through opposition to what you do not identify as. So basically what we see in this particular novel is that playing by the rules of society establishes yourself as an individual, but it's also going to let other people know themselves that, you know, if we think of ourselves in, in Daisy's shoes, um, she's trying to be a certain way that she feels is authentic to herself and not play by societal conventions. But in doing so, she's also reaffirming those conventions because other people are looking at her and saying, I am not like her. I don't want to be like her. So therefore, I know myself better because I know I am not Daisy. So society is, is really constraining her and defining her at the same time that it's reinforcing its own descriptions and constraints. So what society is basically saying to her is that if you don't act accordingly, you make it difficult for others to know how to behave or respond. And you see that in these conversations between uh, Mrs. Walker and Winterbourne when Mrs. Walker says something to the equivalent of, I wish she would know, I wish she would act a certain way so then I would know how to act, right? If I knew exactly what she was um, in terms of her class or in terms of her behavior, then I would know how to shape my own behavior accordingly. But Daisy refuses to reflect these things back. She's not showing Winterbourne, Mrs. Costello, Mrs. Walker, who she necessarily is, so that way they don't know how to act towards her and it makes them feel their own sense of um, stable identity has become compromised because they don't really, it, it makes them feel unsettled or anxious because they don't know what to do with her. And then once they can make a decision about her, that's when they know, okay, now I know how to treat her. I know how to act myself and that makes me feel more secure. So the sooner basically one knows how to read the other, the better one knows how to act him or herself. So they can figure out um, exactly how their own behavior should be shaped once they understand what the other is doing. So again, if Daisy becomes this elusive other that is not able to be pinned down, that causes social unease and anxiety within the group um, around her because of that necessity of identifying the self through opposition to the other. Now, when you have a realist text, you'll remember last week I talked about how realism is always trying to teach in a certain way and that social issues are always going to be dealt with in a realist text in a pretty explicit way. 
So one of the things that you see working in Daisy Miller is gender disparity, and it's brought up quite prominently through the conversations between Daisy and Winterborn, and then through the conclusion of the novel as well. Of course, if you read Daisy's death as being a punishment for her um, extreme behavior, it's a pretty damning um, type of indictment of her uh, behavior here, that it's something where she's gone um, out of society's conventions, and in fact, she can't even survive outside of society, right? She dies. So there's this idea where she's being punished with the death at the end um, that could be, you know, we could make that argument. But even before that death happens, she's also punished um, within social circles because she becomes snubbed by the people that she wanted to go to their parties and now people won't talk to her. And she um, is frustrated by this, but then also kind of refuses to play by that game. And she tells Winterburn, I've never let a gentleman dictate to me or to interfere with anything I do. So she's being um, too independent for society. They don't really like the way that she goes off and knows her own mind and does her own thing. And there's a double standard there that's pointed out by the text because Winterburn can do anything that he wants to. And she even says a man may know everyone, right? There's no restrictions on his acquaintance while she's not supposed to know or acknowledge or be acquaintances with certain people because it could compromise her reputation. Um, however, the text is also implying that men are sensitive about their reputations. So think about how Winterborn is worried about what other people will think about him. And even this is emphasized, as I mentioned earlier, through this role of gossip at the conclusion of the text, where you have the narrator coming back in and talking about him being involved with an older lady and that there's these whispers of gossip that are following him. So even though we haven't heard those whispers of gossip during the text and during his acquaintance with Daisy, we have to assume that there's been this kind of background noise and even, you know, Mrs. Walker and Mrs. Costello are sort of kind of implying this to him, but he's not really ready to cast Daisy off yet in the same way that they are. Um, but in the background noise, society is judging him. So men are also subject to the same um, standards, even though there is a um, difference or a disparity in how strict that standard is applied. So we can ask the question then, is the text critiquing or is it supporting conventional societal behavior? Because remember, um, Daisy doesn't win here. So, and, and we also get this sort of implication at the end that maybe Daisy had, Daisy had hoped that Winterborn would save her, that if he had just um, asked her out or paid her more attention, that he could have rehabilitated her reputation or reined her in in some way. So there's some ambiguity that's happening at the end of the text about how much Daisy really was trying to get him to reach out to her. And then what is Winterburn's real responsibility for her? And then if you have James, um, the author, sort of killing Daisy off, so to speak, at the end of the novel, um, is this actually reinforcing the status quo about gender? Is it saying, well, yeah, Daisy got what she deserved because she broke all the rules. She was out late at night. She should have known better. Um, Winterborn, who's our main um, point of identification for the text, judges her. Everyone else is judging her. So really, in the end, the novel, is it actually just suggesting that maybe Daisy was wrong? Um, I think the ambiguity is left in there on purpose for us. Again, think about the great ambiguity at the end of The Turn of the Screw. I don't think James wants to close off all readings and to give us a certain moral lesson, but the lesson is definitely there and definitely more explicit than in something like The Turn of the Screw. In addition to gender, there are several other markers of identity that are brought up in this text that function as a way to think about how people read one another and to really maybe make the original audience and even us today question how we're interpreting people, how we're judging them, and the ways that we tend to, again, define our own self-identity against or with certain points of, of identity markers. So you can see um, two things here on the next couple of slides, nationality and ethnicity. So nationality here comes up in play. Remember that um, Daisy and the Millers are American. So like gender, nationality becomes a way of reading people, and you really see that happen in the way that other the other European characters are sort of judging them or making assumptions about them. So the Millers 
others are seen as being ignorant and uncivilized, but they're not necessarily bad. The mother's too hands off. Um, the brother's kind of running wild at different points, and they're not really fitting in because they're not native um, Europeans. So being this kind of outsider status is another way that Daisy is read or interpreted in addition to her gender. Um, and also importantly, the Americans are trying to be in with the Europeans. And in fact, you see some allusions to other Americans within the text like Winterborn who are trying to use Daisy as a way to establish that they aren't like those Americans. So shunning Daisy is a way for these other Americans to establish their own acceptable behavior and to show that they're superior to Daisy and the Millers um, in order to get this sort of insiderness with other Europeans. So as I mentioned with Winterborn being subject to scandal or gossip, there is this kind of insider outsider thing happening within the text um, where people are using one another in order to establish a sense of superiority based on their nationalities. And in addition to nationality, you have ethnicity as becoming a really big focal point at the end of the text as well. So Daisy's relationship with Mr. Giovanelli is even more subject to scandal because he is Italian and considered foreign, right, by the British audience here. So Mrs. Walker can invite a variety of people to her parties, and Americans or the English can travel to foreign places, but having a public relationship with a foreign quote-unquote person was less acceptable. So we weren't um, as as readers, we weren't really necessarily supposed to see Daisy and Giovanelli's relationship as being okay if she had just um, participated by society in society's conventions. If she had just let him court her, um, maybe it would have been fine. This is actually not what James is suggesting because by having Mr. Giovanelli be her love interest, he's actually pushing it even further for us to ask how are people looking at her because she's dating someone that racially and ethnicity wise would not be considered appropriate for her. So this is the strange tension of the text though, is that James doesn't demonize Mr. Giovanelli in any way. He's portrayed as other, but he's also being portrayed as a gentleman and he's really not a villain even though he ultimately has some responsibility for Daisy's death, right? Perhaps he shouldn't have let her compromise her reputation. He shouldn't have let her um, go out really late at night with him. But he was charmed by her, and he tries to tell Winterburn, you know, he defends Daisy's honor, and he says, you know, she really wasn't doing anything wrong, and I really loved her, and, you know, I was just kind of swept along by her, and I think that what we're supposed to see and what Winterburn really reveals to us is that Giovanelli is not a bad person here, that he almost respects him in some ways. So the text plays with this idea then of pushing Giovanelli into being that other role, that kind of, especially in 19th century British literature, if you were non-English speaking, you were even more othered um, in your non-nativeness. And, you know, kind of pushing him into this role where he would be seen as a compromising factor, but then also allowing that ambiguity, showing the other side of him, not demonizing him, not finding him to be someone that is a complete villain and showing that um, ambiguity about his character. It really challenges the reader to think about what kind of judgments are being made and how we're also defining ourselves through these appeals to nationality and ethnicity in a way to better articulate what um, we think of ourselves by opposing ourselves to someone that would be considered other. So with all of these social issues at work, I want to end with asking questions about um, Levine's definitions of realism that we read before. So think about where we see this deflation of ambition that he identified as one of the key qualities of realism. So ambition can be social ambition, with Daisy perhaps wanting to go to these parties and be acknowledged, but then feeling slighted by other people. Um, it can literally be the ambition to live, and we see that deflation of ambition happen at the end of the text when she is um, killed by her own uh, willingness to go out and she ends up catching malaria for it. We can also see deflation of ambition in Winterborn, where he has definitely this ambition to be seen as being better than other Americans, better than other people within society, but we find 
that he's being gossiped about and he's not actually better than them. Um, we also see some anti-heroism here. And we could ask the question, which person in this text is really supposed to be the hero? Is it Daisy? Is it Winterborn? Is it both of them? Um, this kind of erasure of a heroic narrative is definitely present in terms of what a realist text is doing. It's not letting the hero triumph over circumstances, but both Daisy and Winterborn are subject to conventions and societal constraints and are not allowed to escape into this individualistic life that they perhaps think that they're capable of living, um, particularly Daisy, thinking that she can exist outside of so social conventions when, in fact, she's constrained by them and is not allowed to enter certain areas or to be or to know certain people because of society's conventions. And then again, as I mentioned before, um, Realist novels are always trying to teach, so is this novel trying to be didactic? Um, does Winterburn learn anything from Daisy's death? Well, we're not really sure. Um, do readers learn anything from her death or from this novel? It's not conventionally realism in the sense that social issues are being um, used as a call to action. And, and as a more like social, um, novel like that would be about factory work or that would be um, like North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell, novels that would be really focused on um, things like labor and how to change and how to um, deal with industrialization or child labor, things like that. You would have a realist novel that was a lot more dramatically moralistic and trying very hard to um, push the reader towards a certain point of view about things like labor or reform or things like that. Um, this is less so, right? So that's why I have didactic question mark and kind of asking this idea about are we really learning anything? The issues are there. The, the lesson could definitely be pushed that Daisy has transgressed, and so this is the lesson that, that young women reading the novel should learn. Don't do this or you might die, right? But as I've also mentioned, I think there's some amb ambiguity here because James is writing at the end of the, um, the 19th century where we're really starting to play with the idea of subjectivity and interiority and how how do we really draw conclusions? What can we really know? So you're starting to see a little bit of 20th century modernism in this text where it's not going to necessarily give you a really strict, definite answer that you can then take with you as a reader and apply to your life. So for this reason, um, even though it's dealing with realism and we're seeing a lot of these conventions and fixations that realism has, we're also edging our way into the 20th century here with much more ambiguity and interiority, um, which we're going to see even more of as we talk about naturalism next time. Thanks.